good? Fantastic. Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself. This is the opening line of Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. And it's perhaps one of the most recognizable first lines in literature. The other day, in my AP Literature class, we took this first line and we picked it apart. We looked at every single word of this phrase from Mrs. Dalloway. Her name is Clarissa. So why in the opening line are we referring to her in the formal? Flowers, why is she buying flowers specifically? What's the meaning there? Why do people buy flowers? We did this for every single word of this phrase. Now, how many of you have ever done something like this and thought your teacher was absolutely losing their mind? Like there is no way there is that much meaning embedded in one sentence of a piece of literature, right? Literature is a form of storytelling. And storytelling is one of the oldest forms of human expression. But it's got its own little set of rules, which is part of what makes it unique from visual storytelling or oral storytelling. So as both a writer and a reader, I set out on a little quest to figure out whether or not my teacher was actually going crazy when they were finding meaning in just a handful of words. To do that, I broke it down into a couple little steps. First, I obviously had to write a piece. I had to take a piece of literature where I knew the meaning, and the only way to do that was to be the author of the piece. The second was to share that piece, because in order to figure out if my vision matched up with what other people saw in it, I had to, of course, have the other people there to pull things out of it. And then the third, of course, was to analyze and to compare my thoughts and observations with those of readers to see whether or not my ideas as the author lined up with those of the reader. When I started this creative process, I interviewed a man named Mr. Ron Howland, who is the former head of the English department here at Andover High School. He's an English teacher, and he's also a novelist. So of course, he and I talked about a, very, a lot of very niche novelist writer things that I'm sure would go over a lot of people's heads unless they spent their free time, like I do, writing novels. But one of the things he said to me that stuck out is on the slide behind me. That is, there are two kinds of writers. Some plot everything, and some don't. They discover. Put it in more simple terms for those of you who are a little more um, layout-minded, I made a little fun chart. I personally happen to belong to the latter group. I'm an experimenter. So when I write, I start with a basic idea. And in this case, that idea happened to be a retelling of a traditional Robin Hood story. But I wanted to focus less on the titular character of Robin Hood, you know, classic bow and arrow, and instead shift the focus to Maid Marian and to Prince John, who's traditionally the villain. So I had that idea. And then from there, I went into experimenting. I didn't sit and plot out and come out with an outline and do the, the stereotypical writer thing with a bunch of pages full of bulleted notes. No, I just sat down at my computer and started typing. And I started playing with voice and tone and a lot of those little niche things until eventually I settled in. And it started to make sense. And then I'd go back and fix things and play around with language. And I settled into this tone that was very poetic and indicative of some of the early Robin Hood legends. A lot of it came out of poetry and you know, early medieval ballad. And that's a little bit of the sort of tone that the piece started to take on. So once I had about four or five pages of draft, I took it to a dramatic literature class. And all I did was hand it to them. And I said, here. Here's an excerpt. Read it and see what you think. What do you observe about this piece? You know, what's there? What, what grabs your attention? What do you see? And interestingly enough, they picked up on all of the little niche things. I had a little checklist when I started writing. You know, I want to put in figurative language. I want to see if they pick up on this, you know, slightly archaic tone. 
And sure enough, as I'm listening to the class discussion, they're checking off those boxes. You know, they're noting the tone. They're getting the Robin Hood references. But what was especially interesting to me was they got more than what was in my little checkbox. One of my personal favorite things that they pointed out was the fact that the punctuation, and they even admitted that they don't normally note punctuation in a piece, and yet for this piece they did. But they compared the punctuation to Shakespeare, and my little writing ego just inflated about 10 times, because if there's anyone you want to be compared to as a writer, it's definitely Shakespeare. <laughs> so, even though I didn't intentionally write the piece with punctuation in mind and extensive semicolons, they noted that. And it added to that sort of medieval tone that I keep talking about. And they thought it really worked. And it added to that meaning, even though I didn't put it in there. So, even though you know, Virginia Woolf may not have put as much intention in that one phrase of Mrs. Dalloway, I have a feeling that she might not mind that we're pulling all of these nuances out of it because it's still contributing to the larger idea. All of our, you know, the, the minute things that we pull out of an analysis, even if we think they're crazy, I, they probably align with the writer's intent. At least in my case, they definitely did. And now going forward, as I continue to work on the piece, I'm going to have those things in the back of my head. Oh, the readers really liked the use of semicolons. So let's, let me make sure to continue that on as I keep writing more chapters. Because at the end of the day, you're not crazy for reading too much into literature. Thank you.
There we go. Okay. No, I have to click it. I think it was just. I think, Mr. Brennan, just the fact that you just walked into the room solved it. <laughs> yeah. Am I good to go? Okay. I have never gotten frostbite. And I know you're probably like, okay, what? It's not really an accomplishment. It's not something I'd put on my resume or anything. But considering that I've been skiing for 15 years, almost every weekend, some extreme conditions, it's honestly pretty impressive. You know, I've skied in windstorms, snowstorms, negative 20 degree temperatures, and I've never gotten frostbite. But it's not because I have some superpower or anything. I have this little guy to thank. Every time I step outside and check the weather and I feel like it might be cold enough, I go into my mud room, grab a hand warmer from the box of hand warmers we have, rip open the packaging, shake it, throw it in my glove, and go on with my day. You know, I'm not really thinking about, oh, is my hand warmer going to fall out? If it gets too warm, I'll throw it in my pocket, but I'm not really checking on my hand warmer. But there is one thing that over my 15 years of skiing I have experienced a lot. And to no surprise, that is climate change. Now, I didn't really know at the beginning of the year what causes climate change. I kind of just assumed that it was the same old global warming that causes everything else. And I especially never thought that my hand warmer that I use every time it's cold enough would contribute to that climate change. But when I started to look into it, I realized that there are a lot of factors that are specific to New England that causes climate change. Now, some of it has to do with the snowmaking and the um, grooming, but a lot of it impacts our ecosystems. And when I thought about it at the beginning of the year, I wanted to know like, what was causing this, and I wondered that if my hand warmer had anything to do with this. I mean, my hand warmer is the only part of my ski equipment that isn't reusable. So, I decided to do some research and I looked into our ecosystems. Our ecosystems are very, very valuable um, in our ski resorts and there are, they're in a lot of danger. So essentially, the snowmaking uses a lot of water and that water is supposed to be for the habitats. Now, there is a mountain in Massachusetts called Wachusett and they are said to use over a thousand gallons of water per minute when snowmaking. And all of this water is so valuable to these animals and also the grooming. So the grooming are big machines and they'll go up the mountain, come down, because we don't get a lot of snow. The snow gods aren't always on our sides like they are out west. Out in the east, we need to groom and we need to snowmake. And this grooming, it um, like breaks up the soil and ruins any chances of plant life, any food life, all of that. So once I kind of investigated this a lot, I realized like our ecosystems can't afford any more human um, done damage. And I figured, you know, my hand warmer, when I'm not paying attention to it, could be causing some of this damage to these ecosystems. And like I said earlier, this is a vision of snowmaking. It is one of the leading factors to our global warming in our ski resorts. So I decided to do some investigation. And one day when I was out skiing, I wanted to make sure that you know, I wasn't the only one who wasn't paying attention to what was happening to my, snowmake, my um, hand warmer. So my family and I, we took one day and we all took pictures. And this is seven of the 28 hand warmers that we found out on the ski resort. And so in this one, as you can see, like, like this is the inside content of the hand warmer and so is up here. And then we also have some of the physical hand warmers itself over here. And then we have some of the actual packaging, um, which is another issue that I found later in my project. 
So now I kind of knew that I wasn't the only one who didn't realize the effects that leaving my hand or my hat on the ground. But when I wanted to think of something to combat this, a lot of people asked me, well, you know, there are such things as reusable hand warmers. But I figured not a lot of people use them, and I know I didn't use them, because they're super bulky and they're also super expensive. And if you're not an experienced skier, you're not going to go out and buy a reusable hand warmer, or a reusable hand warmer to use once when you could just use your air-activated one. So I created a survey of a bunch of questions about hand warmers, but my main takeaway from it was that 84.4% of the people that took my survey used non-reusable air-activated hand warmers. And the other 9.4% were unsure of which hand warmer they used, so it is most likely an air-activated hand warmer. So now I have all of this evidence of the popularity of hand warmers. You know, the air-activated ones, people are using them, they don't really know how to use them. So I figured, okay, I need to figure out like what inside the hand warmer is causing this issue and can hurt our ecosystems because I didn't know that it was harmful and most people probably don't. So I looked into the chemical process that is oxidation and that is basically how heat is created right inside this little hand warmer. And it's super similar to rust and it's also a very simple chemical process. So basically when you rip open your hand warmer and you start to shake it like so, the oxygen is getting in and is mixing with the carbon and the iron to create a heat reaction. Pretty safe, you know, if it touches your hands, not a big deal. But iron is not supposed to be consumed at such high levels. And I knew this, and I knew that the chemicals in this were not necessarily safe to be consumed by the animals that are living on the sides of the mountains. And I wanted to know how much content was actually in these hand warmers, so I just, to get to the bottom of the problem, I reached out to the hand warmers company. And let's just say they were not super thrilled to be sharing all their information with me. But essentially, out of my interview with them, this is what I got out. They sent me an eight-page report of the hand warmers and the contents in them. And as you can see, the concentration of iron powder in it is super high. And in the earlier days of my project, I did a ton of research on iron toxicity in animals, and there are tons of case studies out there. And one of them is actually on golden retrievers, and it talks about um, the iron toxicity in the golden retrievers and the effects that it can have on them. And some of it are nausea, heart attacks, heart problems, but essentially it all leads to death. And seeing that uh, a big golden retriever cannot handle that much iron in its system, there's no doubt that it will impact the plants, it will impact squirrels, chipmunks, foxes, anything living on the side of these, uh, on the side of the ski slopes that are already in danger. So, it's an issue. There's no doubt about it, but I need to do something to combat this issue. So I talked to a few chemists, talked to Dr. Sanborn, and I was like, what chemical reaction would not be harmful to them. This is a simple one. I was like, it doesn't get much simpler than this. How can we fix this issue? And after a lot of research and talks, we decided on an exothermic reaction that has an acid and a base. And the acid and base would mix and heat react to form um, just a simple salt and water product. And with the simple salt and water product, they can be thrown on the ground and they will just degrade into the ground because they're natural products. The only issue that came with this was that since there's water involved, there needs to be a plastic packaging. So then um, from there, I looked into a lot of different compostable plastics. And essentially, um, once all the snow melts in like May, April, and these hand warmers are left on the sides of the ground, if it's compostable plastic, the sun will catch it and it'll just compost into the ground. Harmless. There's no toxic chemicals in it, completely safe for the animals. But another thing that I learned throughout all of my research is that it's not necessarily the products that are going to save our environment. We can have a brand new hand warmer, but if people are still going to misuse them, and if people aren't aware of the consequences of their actions, especially when they're such avid outdoorsmen, you know, that's what's going to be contributing to our climate change even more. So at the end of the day, I realized that 
the ski resorts need to do stuff to combat this. When I went, for example, and went to go take pictures of the hand warmers that were on the sides of the slopes, there were no signage, there's no fines, there's no ticket revoking, there's no specific place to dispose of your hand warmers. And people don't know this. Not everyone that skis is an experienced skier. And if you have a newcomer or someone who's just trying it out, they're not going to know how to dispose of these issues. And we can sit back and watch our snow melt earlier and our winters be shorter and complain about it. But if we're not taking the proper action, it's on us. And the other thing I learned, especially through my report that I showed you earlier, it was that the, these um, companies are not marketing their products correctly. You know, on the eight page report that they gave me, there was a ton of things in specific um, bold lettering that said to not be consumed. And there is, that is put nowhere on the packaging of the hand warmers. It just says all natural, which is false. So in my conclusion, if I want longer winters and I want to be able to ski and I want my kids to be able to ski, this hand warmer needs to be implemented, and it is, needs to be implemented in the correct way with ski resorts having the proper signage, fines, like I said earlier, and proper marketing. Because while I don't want to get frostbite, I also don't want to watch our, our mountains deteriorate. And with a little bit of love and precaution, we can make it work. Thank you. It was the year 1692. Jean Sereau and his family were taken into captivity in Boston because the French-Canadian family was illegally living on the coast of Maine. However, not to be so easily defeated, Jean Sereau bargained with Bostonian authorities, convincing them to allow him and his son-in-law go free under the supervision of two former French-Canadian defectors to assassinate a French-Canadian baron in exchange for his family's freedom. However, upon being released, Jean Sereau refused to betray his French-Canadian roots, instead taking the two men sent to supervise him hostage and turning them into French-Canadian authorities for enough money to free his family. Most people don't know this much about their great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfathers. However, after three years of extensive genealogical research, I am happy to say that I do. Three years of genealogical research. Well, that's been enough to do plenty of things. Uh, for one, it's allowed me to create this absolute monstrosity of a family tree. Uh, yeah, just for reference, I am five foot two. That thing is five foot six. So yeah, it's a little bit intimidating to stand around. I've also had the opportunity to attend multiple talks and discussions regarding genealogy, at which I am the youngest person there by, I'm gonna say a solid 50 years. Um, and because of my slightly different age, one of the questions that I'm often asked is, you know, why? Why do you do this? What has inspired you to want to create a family tree at such a young age? And despite the absolute validity of that question, I've never quite had an answer. So when given the opportunity, I knew I wanted to explore why do I, or anyone for that matter, feel the need to create a family tree? What are we getting from this? What are the benefits of doing so? And I knew that in order to find the right answer, I couldn't just focus on what people use genealogy for today. This was a question I had to look at the entire 
history of genealogy in order to answer. And at a surface level, historically, the purposes of genealogy don't really have too much in common. Justifying the reign of a king versus forcing an identity of inferiority upon an enslaved group of people versus nowadays people using genealogy as a tool to reconnect with lost relatives and make the world feel just a little bit smaller, they don't seem to really have a whole lot in common, and I'll be the first person to admit that. However, when you peel back the surface level, when you peel back the historical context, you can start to see that there is one underlying feature that interconnects each and every single one of these events. And that underlying sort of same theme is identity. Identity is the same thing that connects each and every single one of these uses. It's the reason that everyone has been creating family trees all this time. So that answers my question, right? That's done, like the cat's talk is over, right? It's, it's identity. Uh, yeah, that was wrong. Um, I was not satisfied with this answer, not even a little bit, because even though now I knew that genealogy and identity were linked, I still had no idea how. I wanted to find exactly how genealogy was influenced by identity, how identity was influenced by genealogy. And I knew that in order to do that, I would have to discuss with individuals. Because identity is a largely individual perception, therefore I had to speak with multiple different people. And one of the people I spoke with was Christine Feichter, who is a genealogist who aims to connect uh, people with their long lost biological families. And you know, one of the questions I asked her was, you know, in your experience, why do people want to do genealogical research and how do they react when you reintroduce them to their quote unquote natural clan? She said something that really influenced the entirety of my research. Everyone has a different personality. Everyone has different past experiences, and everyone has a different expectation for what they're going to get out of genealogy. Therefore, there's no one reason why everyone does genealogy. There's not one reason or one way that everyone reacts to genealogy and being reintroduced to their family. You know, she's had people react from near indifference where they pretty much just say, great, I'm gonna go about my life, to people who, this is a life-changing experience. Their entire identity changes to mold around their newfound biological families. And this was really supported by a survey that I sent out to a bunch of young people who are interested in genealogy. Uh, just for some context, over the past few months, I have been creating a group, a network of sorts, um, of young genealogists uh, who are interested in discussing their ideas and um, helping each other out with genealogical pursuits. And in this uh, discussion, in this forum, people, without me ever prompting them, might I add, started to often discuss why they did genealogical research. You know, what they got out of that. And, you know, of course, I was sitting in the corner furiously scribbling notes because this is my research and I'm not even asking them to do it and they're doing it for me. Um, but when I made the survey, I based a lot of my questions around their experiences. And what I got back was incredibly supported by what Christine had said. You know, they had so many different reasons for wanting to start a family tree. My favorite one, personally, was I literally begged them to do it, and they felt bad, and so they did it. And another person, you know, for example, said genealogy is a family tradition, and they wanted to continue that tradition. However, the one thing that each and every single one of these people had in common was when I asked them if they felt that the way they view themselves, their family, and or the world around them had changed because of genealogy, Everyone, with the exception of one person, said that in some way their identity had been changed because of their genealogical research. In every single case, that change was for the better. So this was great. You know, I was really happy with my results, but if you haven't noticed, I have a bit of a stake in this project, and I wanted to get some answers of my own. So I did probably my least favorite thing I've ever had to do, and that was journal about my feelings on a regular basis. Um, I hated it, I will never be doing it again. Um, but what I really wanted to find, every time I did genealogy, I did some research, I had a discussion about genealogy, I had just a thought that I thought would be pertinent to write down, I wrote it down in my log. 
And what I eventually found, one of the things that I thought was the most interesting from this log was the fact that the more I couldn't find information on one side of my family, the more I wanted to find information on that side of the family, which was almost completely illogical. You know, at one point I had almost completely dropped the French Canadian side, which is incredibly easy to find information on, to focus entirely on the Italian side, at, which I could find next to nothing on. But I was so set on finding that information, and not being able to find that information only made me want to find it more. And I discovered that this was likely because I just wanted to verify my identity. I wanted to validate my experience as an Italian, my identity as an Italian, and the inability to do that, not just to change my identity or influence it, but just to validate it, just made me want to do it that much more. So as I said, everyone's a different person. There's no single one universal reaction to doing genealogical research. No one reason why every single person chooses to do genealogical research. However, though I set out to discover you know, why people want to do genealogical research, I almost found something more important. Why people want to continue to do genealogical research. Because once you start seeing these benefits, once you start being able to validate and improve upon your identity, once you start being able to understand your place in the world in relationship to your family, in relationship to yourself, you don't want to stop. It was the year 1692, and Jean Soreau had an incredible swashbuckling adventure. And yet somehow, I still think that he would be amazed that 200 years later, his ninth great granddaughter is living the life that she is now. I don't think that he could ever possibly have imagined that I would seek to understand myself through him, that I would study him to understand myself. And I don't think that he could have ever possibly imagined in his po um, most wild dreams that I would have the opportunity today to stand before you and say, give it a shot, do some research, Find your Jean Sereau. You might just find yourself along the way. Thank you. All right, cool. <laughs> Here we go. Are we good to go? All right. Since we were little kids, since the beginning of time, we basically have held on to fairy tales, whether that was Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, even the gingerbread man. And yet, every single one of their stories seems too good to be true, too unrealistic to ever have had a hell hold on reality. And yet, somehow, they did it. They turn their fantasies into re their realities. So if that's what happens in dreams, let's bring it a little bit back over to reality. Look at your phones, these little tiny little black squares that can do so many different functions, whether it's to find your other phone, um, whether it's to calculate, came from the ANIAC, which is basically a giant machine that could only have performed simple calculations, and it took up the entire wall. That and so much more is in your phones. 
this turned, and that, and so the engineers in the 1940s, when this, when the ENIAC was made, probably could have, the, the phone was probably out of way out of their wildest dreams. This could have never happened. And let's look a little now at the, at the present. We have systems that can intake data, and we are dreaming of them in order to make them to make flawless human decisions. I'm talking about artificial intelligence. I'm talking about artificial life. So what is artificial intelligence? Essentially, it's uh, the creating of machines in order to think and make decisions like humans with a whole bunch of different subsets. So for example, we have uh, machine learning, um, which is essentially it intakes data, it throws it through an algorithm, and then it is able to make decisions like a human. So for example, if I wanted to get a program to tell the difference between cat and dogs, I would give the program pictures of cats and dogs, it would do its thing, and then it would tell me, hey, this is a cat, this is a dog. Pretty cool, huh? And then we also have things such as natural language processing, um, which is essentially the study of the interactions between human and machine through the natural language. So this, what I mean by natural language is literally English, Spanish, German, all of your languages that you can speak, it's going to be able to figure out what's going, to, what's going on. So I'm pretty sure at this point most of you know Alexa is an AI, Siri is an AI. The Google search engine is also an AI. So when you get a million uh, articles telling you about cell research and the cell membrane, that's only because you put in 100 tabs trying to finish your bio project. <laughs> but artificial intelligence can also be applied in the medical field. Just think about that. Just potential that has that blows the door wide open for us. So, for example, actually, I can bring up cancer is a very, very large field where artificial intelligence is used. With doctors saying that it's about up to 10% of misdiagnosis, and with the VGM Safety and Quality Journal actually saying it's 28% of people that are misdiagnosed with cancer. AI has been, used, has been utilized and developed and given MRI and CT scans in order to essentially tell the doctors who may or may not be making a whole lot of human error um, about, okay, is this a tumor? Is this not one? Do I need to be concerned? Because 28%, if you were misdiagnosed, you don't want that to happen. That's a lot of heartbreak, stress, tears, money, travel, time, that you may not even be getting the correct treatment. Over in the University of Oxford, actually, in the UK, pro uh, programmers were able to develop a program that takes a look at your blood vessels, essentially, for biological red flags in order to tell you you might be a high-risk patient right now of having a heart attack. 80% of heart attacks, um, of cardiovascular diseases, such as heart attacks and strokes, are preventable. 80%. If we could get that warning out to people early on, imagine how much life we could, lives we could save. Imagine how much money, time, stress, heartbreak, pain that we could save and spare people from if they were just given the warning and the detection early on. So imagine there is so much possibility of what we could do with artificial intelligence in, in, um, in the medical field. Imagine if we were able to lower the cost of artificial intelligence in, as well. And that means that so much more people can get access to healthcare, can get um, help, the, help out the doctors who are short on time and are already seeing maybe 30, 50 patients a day who are clearly overstressed at this point, especially with this time in COVID, um, and be able to help them out, help the community out, and be able to pass this out to the larger population. UN Sustainable Goal number three. We're doing it. <laughs> However, that also kind of gets, ends up with a lot, a whole bunch of other questions because now we're entering the territory of giant what ifs. Let's giant questions of let's push the limit and see where we're going. When we need to cycle back to before the limit, actually, and take a look at what we already have. The biggest problems, as you can see, are probably going to be within the training data. Now, why is this? Artificial intelligence needs data. Um, in order to do everything. It needs the training set of data in order to uh, train the algorithm, train itself on, okay, what is X, what is Y. And now, especially with medical AI, what is this data? This data comes from you. It comes from real cases in order for the AI to train 
and classify other real cases. This might be your typing speed. This might be your blood glucose levels. This might be your mammograms, which is essentially uh, x-rays for breast cancer. This might be, this is your data that they have to use and that they need to get. So now we've come up with a whole bunch of other issues. We're looking at transparency of between the programmer and the, and the person who's giving up their data. We're looking at consent issues, informed consent issues of both the patient who will be using this um, technology as well as the person who is giving up their data. We're looking at privacy regulations. How much data can they take from you? Which ones can they take from you? And how do you know which ones are being taken from you? And now that's, that you can bring in the government as well, especially with this case, because it's such a developing field, it's very difficult to put regulations on something that may or may not exist. That's a whole other slew. And then we come to a giant, giant question of what if the data is biased? Robots, I hate to say it, can be racist sometimes. Doctors as it is, are biased. You do not want your artificial intelligence to also be biased. Now, how does that happen? This is when you give the training data set too much of a certain demographic, whether that's gender, whether that's race, whether that's even from the same hospital sometimes. That's a funnier story, but I'm not going to tell that. So now we come to the big question of should we even use artificial intelligence in medicine? Sure, are the programmers and developers ready to send this out? Because it may already be in the field, but it's only at its very first stages. Are, is the public ready to take on this giant advancement from trusting human decisions to allowing a computer to automate things? So I asked the question to a whole bunch of people. I actually started off um, with Dr. Emily Liu, um, who is an endocrinologist uh, and basically works with a whole bunch of diabetes patients. Um, and she was actually basically singing her praises to me about the artificial intelligence that she uses uh, with the CGM, a continuous glucose monitor, which essentially just uh, takes data from the patient's body in order to uh, quantify how, what are their blood sugar levels, um, and the insulin pump. So what that boils down to is the CGM will take the level of blood glucose, it will send it to the insulin pump, and the insulin pump on its own will take that data and determine how much insulin the patient needs. And she was telling me about how now the patients don't need to inject themselves every single day with insulin. They don't have to count every single meal. They do have to count the carbohydrates and put those in um, manually. However, they don't have to prick their fingers 5, 10, eat 12 times a day in order to manage their diabetes. And she was also telling me about how it made her life easier, about how now if there was an issue with the patient, she doesn't have to go through and say, OK, well, what was yesterday's data? What was the day before? How much other happened there? She has all the data from the artificial intelligence because it was continuously being sent to the CGM. And she has it all with her, so she can look straight at that. Now, put yourself in that situation. If you were given that opportunity to use this CGM and the insulin pump, would you have said yes? And that's what I asked the public. So I have sent out a survey with a little bit of a brief introduction, actually, about mammograms and not CGM and insulin, um, about artificial intelligence. Are you willing to use it? Are you not willing to use it? Um, and I sent this out to AHS students, and I sent this out to parents in the general eastern Massachusetts area. Take a look what they said. So I first asked them, after having given them that introduction to artificial intelligence, all right, Positives and negatives, what can you come up with and what can you think of right now? And a lot of them hit actually the issues that I was talking about earlier. You can look at positives, saving time. Artificial our AIs, they can compute a lot faster than humans can. They can get through eight hours of brain signals faster than a human can. There's gonna, there may be less misdiagnosis because AIs have been proven sometimes to be more accurate than the human. Less human error, efficient. Early detection on. They can figure out the patterns that we humans haven't been able to connect from the data. And they also pointed out a lot of the negatives. Ac accountability in the AI. If something goes wrong, who is it that we have to blame? Data privacy, overuse, errors, and especially bias in the data. What happens if that happens? And so I asked them which one matters more. And well, 40% of people said that the positives matter more, and another 30% said, hey, they're about equal. 
about 70% of people already giving a pretty positive glance of artificial intelligence in, in, in medicine. There's also another 11%, however, and only 11% that said the negatives are going to matter more. We have to pay attention to those first. So we've got a pretty aware audience of what's going on. And so I asked them a general question of, okay, well, with artificial intelligence already in medicine, how do you feel about that? We've got a couple neutrals in there, a lot of positives. No negatives. No negatives at all in that field. We're like, all right, so this is just going to help me explain to you, hey, I wonder what this trend is looking like. It's looking pretty positive. And so then I took the question a little bit back, and I brought it to yourself. Think of yourself, because as much as we are like the humans, a lot of us think about, oh, this would be great for someone else. We think about that a lot. Sometimes we don't think about, Did I, do I trust this? Would I do this to myself? Because sometimes we think to ourselves, mm, I would do this to someone else, but I don't trust it enough for myself. So I asked that question. 63% of people said yes. They would do it to themselves. If they were given the option as this is an option for their treatment, they said yes. And the other 37%, maybe. 0% said no. So I think you all know where this is heading. I gave them the big question of should we use artificial intelligence in medicine? 100% of people said yes. All 43 respondents to this survey said yes, we should be using artificial intelligence in medicine. Now with this increasing positive trend, a lot of you may be thinking, oh God, they're being super over eager about this. And to be fair, they could be. But I also asked them, okay, well, how do you think, do you want to change artificial intelligence as it continues to, de to develop? And 30% of people said yes. And a large majority said maybe. So they're aware that artificial intelligence may not be at its best form quite yet and that there's still going to be a lot of concerns about it. But it still can be a little bit overeager. So I talked to someone who actually made it, a data scientist um, who did not want to be identified. So they were explaining to me about how they were going through the process of using the data bank that they had, um, which was large quantities of medical information to use uh, algorithms and models in order to figure out, okay, what can I do? What are patterns that I'm finding? They actually did work on the um, AI looking for tumors in different cancers and MRI scans. So they were also talking to me a lot about how there weren't any con big consent or privacy, um, big consent issues or transparency issues, or even sometimes privacy regulation issues sometimes, because there was so much listed in the terms and conditions that they needed um, to ask their uh, patients and they went up signing up for their services first that you had to agree to it. And if you wanted your data out, your data was taken out immediately. So even if your data had been used as training data for some um, artificial intelligence, they would redo that entire model without your, without your data if you asked to take it out. So with all of these, um, she was also actually talking a lot about how the positives of artificial intelligence and how she saw a lot of potential in the field. So we asked the question, is AI as it is now ready to be implemented into the medical field? And uh, she just kind of softly laughed at me and said, no, we're a long ways from being ready. But that's your professional opinion on where we're going. It's not quite there yet. Technical side still definitely needs a lot of work. And we were ready to bring up those previous issues um, about artificial intelligence and talking about that extensively. But. Artificial intelligence is a field that is daily receiving breakthroughs. It is a field that is constantly and constantly developing. It is developing so fast that the, even the government can't keep up. But artificial intelligence is also very much a ship that has a whole bunch of holes that we need to patch up before we, we were able to send it speed sailing across the seas. However, as you can see, when the, the fantasy becomes a reality, and we're able to bring artificial intelligence and fully implement it into the medical field. We're going to be ready for it. Thank you.
So I'm just going to start off and share a little video clip with you guys from one of the most iconic movies of our century. All right, so you're probably wondering why I just showed you a video of an actress getting stabbed in the shower. That was Janet Lee, and it's from the 1960 hit film Psycho, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. Now, for most of us looking back at that, we think it's kind of cheesy. The special effects aren't really scary. We're very used to seeing those types of movies in our daily life. But for the actress Janet Lee, it was very real. She put herself in such a vulnerable position to film that scene that she could not take showers for the rest of her life out of fear of being attacked. So up until her death in 2005, she only took baths. Now, as someone who has done theater since the age of 10, um, I was a little bit surprised to hear about this story. I didn't know that acting could be such a hazardous occupation, and it kind of terrified me. So I wanted to know if this was just a one-time incident or if there were more things like this. So I started kind of falling down a rabbit hole of all different stories of different actors with similar experiences. Bob Hoskins and Who Framed Roger Rabbit was so used to having to visualize uh, the characters being there with him that he actually started hallucinating Roger Rabbit and other cartoon characters far after filming the movie. And his doctor forced him to stop acting because it was so dangerous for him. And a lot of characters who have played the Joker in any film adaptation um, have really seen the effects on their own mental health um, from playing a role that is so terrifying. So I began thinking, if playing a role that is scary or sad can make you feel that way, could playing happy have the same effect? And that's when I came across the North American Drama Therapy Association. Now, drama therapy is the intentional usage of acting or theater to achieve a therapeutic goal. There are tons of different resources that they use and different games and levels of acting that are achieved for the specific group of people being affected. For example, they do a lot of work with autistic children on building social skills and language development. But they also work a lot in the prison reform system, helping people to understand actions and to play characters to gain some empathy and control over how other people and yourself feel in every situation. So I began to think about my own community and what sort of things we might do to help ourselves in any situation. And I thought of Andover High School because it's obviously a very transitional time, anyone in high school will tell you, and it can be hard to balance your academic, social life, as well as your mental health. And oftentimes, that mental health aspect tends to be put on the back burner. So I decided I would reach out to my community and see if they actually wanted my help. And I began conducting interviews with a bunch of different people. I talked to guidance counselors who were saying that even though some kids seek help, they would imagine that a lot more students are struggling than actually reach out to them, mostly because there's a big stigma around mental health and it can be scary to reach out. I also talked to Susan Choquette, who is the drama director here at Andover High School, and she talked a lot about the different um, skills that students learn between their freshman and senior year and how that affects them as people. Lastly, I talked to Laura Chloe Rusick, who is a drama therapy specialist, and she told me a lot about how these drama therapy sessions usually run. And she talked to me about how she had two major groups of drama therapy sessions. One was like elementary and middle school age kids, and the other was adults. So I asked her, do you have any classes for high school students? And she said, yes, but no one comes. Because in high school, students are less likely to put themselves out on the line, try something new, out of fear of failing. So I decided I would reach out to the Drama Guild here at Andover High School and see if they have noticed the same qualities in themselves that I do. There are certain, definitely, techniques that you can use on the stage. For example, presentation skills, memorization, and creativity that you can also use in your schoolwork. So I sent out a survey asking the Drama Guild students if they felt 
strong connections to certain qualities. And I also sent that same survey out to students who did not participate in theater. And what I found most interesting was that 90% of students who participate in theater find themselves to strongly identify with the trait of empathy, which makes sense when you think about it, because having to play a role different from yourself requires the knowledge to understand how it feels standing in someone else's shoes. When I sent this survey out to students that did not participate in theater, only one student said that they strongly identified with the trait of empathy. So I asked a bunch of students at Andover High School if they would participate in a study playing some drama therapy games to see if we could unlock some more qualities that are present in students that participate in theater. And so I forced my H1 class to hang out with me and play drama games all day. And I was a little nervous about it because high school students don't tend to love to play icebreakers, but they seemed to very much enjoy it. The question that I asked them was, what surprised you most about this experience? And every single answer I got was somewhere along the lines of how much fun it was. And this survey was anonymous, so they did not have to say this to appease me. It was simply how they felt about it. The students that came into this experience feeling anxious came out feeling calm. And the students that came into the experience feeling tired came out feeling very energized. So whatever you bring into this experience, is exactly what you're going to get out. You have to put yourself in the correct mind state. Anyone can do drama therapy or any sort of drama technique with no experience prior necessary. And for proof, this is my H1 class at the Powder Puff game. We all became a lot closer after having this experience and it definitely started a friendship bond between a lot of us. So this is a picture from the Drama Guild in 2020. And when I had interviewed Ms. Choquette, one of the things that she said to me was, an actor's job is to be seen, to be heard, and to be understood. And I thought, well, that makes sense. You're on stage, you want people to be able to see what you, see yourself, see what you have to say, hear you, and understand everything you're saying very clearly. And she said, no, not just on the stage, off the stage too. All anybody wants in life is to be seen, and to be heard, and to be understood. And drama therapy opens up that opportunity for us. So now I hope to be able to take this information up to administration and get some programs started so that our H1 classes aren't always quiet and kind of awkward like mine used to be. And we can have some team bonding exercises and really open up about our own school experiences and help each other to improve one another's days and one another's life at Andover High School. So my challenge to all of you is to go about your day and see if you can hear, see, and understand everyone around you. Thank you.